Je t'ai quitté avec beaucoup de regrets, ma chère Adèle. Il me tardera bien d'avoir de tes nouvelles. Adieu, ma chère et tendre amie. Ménage ta santé. Soigne-la bien. C'est la plus grande marque de tendresse que tu puisses me donner. Adieu. Je t'aime de toute mon âme. Sois raisonnable. Tu m'as promis. Saint-Cloud, ce samedi 4h. passion for old papers, all documents from the past. I collect and cherish them like priceless and valuable treasures, saved from oblivion. Witnesses of forgotten lives, stories, expectations, hopes, struggles, captured with ink and paper, forever. There is something unique and unreal in touching and opening a genuine 200 years old letter written in 1810. The scent of paper, the black ink turned brownish, the neatly embellished writing, the beautiful and carefully chosen words. In this letter, a captain writes to a marshal of the empire. He tells the story of his life, his adventures, his worries, his struggles, and asks for help, for financial help, for the education of one of his sons. The marshal wrote, at the back of the letter, in his own hand, à classer pour Paris. As he received this letter, when he was stopping in the southwest in Pressac, on his way back to Paris, he very likely helped the captain. He had a good heart and was known to be generous with people in need. How moving to own a letter found in the papers of a person who lived at the turn of the 18th and the 19th century, who had his moment of glory, appears in many official paintings of the time. The son of an impoverished barber surgeon living in a little village in the southwest of France, who became commander of the Imperial Guard, marshal of the Empire, and Duke of Istria. What if paper allowed us to time travel 200 years ago and to see glimpses of his life?
nice to meet la Duchesse d'Abrantes. Her real name is Lorgino, also known as Lulu. She was born in 1784 and was a good friend of the Marshal. She became, at the end of her life, Honoré de Balzac's mistress. The memoirs she published in 1831 are a gold mine of crunchy, invaluable stories and historical gossips of the time. We will joyfully visit her precious memories for our time travel into the Marshal's life. This extravagant Parisian young lady was given the name of La Peste by Napoleon as she is exquisitely funny, witty, but sometimes really, really naughty and she totally deserves her title. Her family was close to the Bonaparte family. She even received, when she was five years old, a beautiful Marquis de Carabas carriage driven by a chaboté. And her sister received a beautiful, richly ornated copy of Puss in Boots, both offered by Napoleon after they call him Le Chaboté because of his thin legs and his big, big boots. La Duchesse doesn't tell us if the carriage was made in paper or in wood, but we would like to believe that it was made in paper. On this portrait, you see her with her dear husband. Jean Andochuno, a general and friend of the Marshal, and their children. She is a totally accomplished young lady who can sing, write, play music, dance, paint, speak several languages, but also knows how to shoot. Because Andosh, her husband, he is the best shooter in Europe at the time, and he's going to teach her how to shoot. He is also going to teach her how to ride a horse like a man. Let's see what la Duchesse d'Abrantes has to say about her friend. He was at her wedding dinner and they know each other pretty well. Because a portrait is nice, but a description is even better. She starts by saying that he had a rather prepossessing address. He was tall, 180, 5 foot 9, which is very tall for the early 19th century. The average French is 162. He had the mania of the powder, la manie de la poudre, but don't worry, he's going to tell you all his hair secrets in a second. She says that he had very good tea, that's something you can't see on the painting, but yes, he had. She says that he had a slight cast in the eye, yes, but don't worry, don't worry, not to a disagreeable extent, she clarifies. We are relieved. She writes even further that once you get used to it, it was really fine and this little defect was really charming and totally adorable. In his colonel outfit, he was totally making an impression when entering in a room. Duchesse, we believe you. Interesting to notice though that when she describes her dear husband Andosh, he is in his slippers, house coat, snoring or in the most ridiculous situations. You have to read the pages when she describes him going hunting. It is hilarious. In contrast, Monsieur Bessier is always in the most exquisite outfits, all elegant riding on his horse. She completes the description saying that he is the most agreeable and attentive man in the world. I think our Duchesse, she had a little crush on Monsieur Bessier, just saying. For Monsieur Bessier, his hair, it's not a simple haircut, it's a lifestyle. The most important thing that happened at the turn of the 18th and the 19th century in France, it's the hair revolution in the army. The short hair said à la Brutus, with the Brutus haircut against the powdered resistance, like Monsieur Bessier, who was always powdered, we would say at the time, poudre à frima. You had so much powder, it's winter time in your hair. Frima means in French, cool winter weather. So Monsieur Bessier, he likes to have winter in his hair. And among all the soldiers, there was a real competition. The more powder, the better. You needed to be loaded with powder. La Duchesse, she said that long powdered, greasy hair was just disgusting, especially on rainy days. 
But Monsieur Bastien, he doesn't have greasy hair, and he's going to show us how he accomplishes this masterpiece every day. Do you do that also on the battlefield? Ah oui, partout. Quand j'étais jeune, j'ai travaillé dans les shops de barbiers de mon père à Pressac, dans le Quercy. Alors j'en connais un rayon en poudre et en pommade. Ma coiffure, ça s'appelle en oreille de chien. Parce qu'il y a quand même deux oreilles de chien aplaties de chaque côté. Comme ça. Et une longue queue à la brigadière. Mais attention, c'est pas un catogan. Ça ressemble plutôt à une queue à la prussienne. C'était très à la mode sur le directoire chez les incroyables. But why do you keep it if it's completely outdated then? Alors, je trouve personnellement que ça sied fort à mon teint, qui est légèrement allé, et j'aime bien le côté un peu aristo. And how do you do it? Donc, on applique la pommade d'abord. Ça donne une texture aux cheveux, et ça permet à la poudre de mieux adhérer. J'ai un barbier dans mon quartier à Paris qui me fait une pommade pas trop épaisse, qui alourdit pas trop, on peut éviter l'effet casque, et ensuite on applique la poudre bien généreusement. Et pour finir, on noue derrière, et voilà le travail. But what happens when it rains? Ah bah c'est la cata quand il pleut, même avec le bicorne, l'eau se mélange à la poudre et ça tombe en crème sur les épaules. Et ça fait des traînées blanchâtres sur les joues, c'est ravissant. Et ça fait des bonnes notes à la blanchisserie. As his manners are perfect and he is so very elegant, we would say in the 19th century French, il a une belle tournure. He is always chosen for every official reception. Like here on the left, it is Napoleon's second wedding. And you can also see him here at Tilsit. Oh, by the way, he appears in almost all the official paintings of the time. Usually he's hidden somewhere. You are pretty sure to find him. And very often with his good friend Marshall Murat, who also comes from the southwest. They were in high school together and they have known each other for a long, long time. Murat, he is the king of the show. He has no competitors. He is in charge of the whole cavalry and likes to be seen and to be admired. He is the most extravagant officer in the French army and has an absolute passion for clothes and accessories. Once his wife, Caroline Murat, Napoleon's sisters, she discovered that in only four months he had spent 27,000 francs in feathers, in feathers only, to decorate his hats. Is it possible to show off more than here? J'admets, c'est vrai qu'on pavane avec Murat. Mais c'est la moindre des choses quand on a gagné quand même. Cela dit, moi, je suis petit joueur à comparer de Murat. Lui, il a quand même des bottes en cuir rouge, des broderies, des glands, veux-tu en voilà, des plumes de trois pieds de haut sur son chapeau, des manteaux en fourrure, des toques de sultan. Sa selle, c'est une vraie peau de tigre avec la tête, la queue et tout. On se croirait dans les mille une nuits. Il faut bien comprendre qu'il est vraiment comme ça en vrai. Ce n'est pas pour le tableau, c'est mardi gras sur le champ de bataille. Et tout le monde trouve ça parfaitement normal. La Duchesse d'Abrantès, who was friend with his wife, Caroline, by the way, la Duchesse husband, Anders Juno, he was also very close to Caroline, well, so close that he was her lover, and Murat didn't know anything about it. So I was saying, la Duchesse, in her memoirs, she said that Murat first, he had a ridiculous accent, which was By the way, exactly the same one that Monsieur Bessière, but Monsieur Bessière's accent was so cute and adorable, and Murat, it's all ridiculous. And she couldn't understand how so many ladies in Paris stick to this glue. It's her very words. Oh, Duchesse, you're nasty. But she's not as nasty as Marshall Anne, who was Murat and Monsieur Bessière's colleague. And he said from Murat that he had the face of a feathered pug, une face de carlin emplumé. Pour Murat, it's not always easy to be a marshal of the empire. Il 
In October 1801, he married his sweetheart, who also comes from Pressac in Quercy, Marie-Jeanne Adèle La Perrière. She was just 19 years old, and she's sweet, adorable, beautiful. She had an excellent education, but she's not very rich. But Monsieur Bessière, he wanted to marry the daughter of a honest family from his village. It's his own very words. So he couldn't care less for money. He's making 260,000 francs a year, which was a fortune for the time. So they will be fine. At the sumptuous wedding dinner, they had some truffle geese. At this time, they are obsessed with truffle. They put it everywhere. And the geese and the turkeys and the ducks, they are fed with truffles two weeks before getting eaten. Let me tell you, that was pretty delicious. He never wanted to marry a heiress. You would meet the first time the day of the wedding. No, he's a sentimental. He wanted a real marriage. And he loves Adele. He knew her since she was 10 years old. Adele, she will be the perfect wife. The thing is, they often had this conversation with Andosh, his friend. And every time Andosh was asked why he didn't marry a heiress, the daughter of a rich family, he would simply reply, Parbleu, parce qu'elles sont laides comme des chenilles. Upon my word, they are as ugly as caterpillars. This is such an exquisite expression we don't use very much anymore. Harris's will appreciate to be compared to caterpillars, no doubt. When he is at war, he writes to Adele almost every day. Very sweet, very tender letters. Sometimes he even tries to do a bit of poetry when he's inspired. He probably wouldn't win a poetry award for that, but at least he tries. La neige et la glace sont les roses de ce pays. Well, in his letters, he mainly talks about the weather, the food, his horses, the money. He patronizes her for being sick all the time. And worst of all, complaining about being sick. Because Monsieur Bessier, he is never sick. He has the strongest health on earth. So he just can't understand why she's sick all the time. But overall, they are very sweet, very tender, the perfect letters from a perfect husband. Varsovie, 20 janvier 1807. Me voilà de retour de mon expédition, ma chère Adèle. L'empereur m'a donné l'ordre de retourner auprès de lui. Il a bien voulu me témoigner sa satisfaction pour le peu que j'ai fait. C'est ma plus douce récompense. Je reçois 14 de tes lettres à la fois. Tu dois juger si j'étais impatient d'avoir de tes nouvelles. Mais juge de ma peine en apprenant que tu étais malade et que tu étais encore plus frappé que l'année dernière. Adèle, Adèle, ce n'est pas là ce que tu m'avais promis. Dis-moi donc, mon enfant, n'est-il pas dans la nature de tout le monde d'être malade Et te faut-il te tourmenter autant parce que tu es indisposé Cela aggrave ton mal et rappelle-toi comme ta convalescence a été longue et pénible. J'approuve bien fort que tu aies envoyé chercher le médecin du buet. Si tu me crois, tu ferais mieux. Tu ferais un voyage à Pressac, à Varsovie même si tu veux. Mais en entreprenant ce dernier, tu pourrais le trouver long. À présent, je t'écrirai tous les jours. Je ne l'ai pas fait depuis huit jours, cela m'a été impossible. J'étais à 60 lieues du quartier impérial et en route pour m'y rendre. J'arrive et je t'écris à l'instant. Je t'embrasse de tout mon cœur. Monsieur Bessière spent most of his time traveling away from his home, accomplishing all sorts of glorious things on the battlefield. As he is away for many months in a row, sometimes one year, he has to be sure he doesn't forget anything, his toothbrush or his nightgown. But to tell the truth, he is a sort of minimalist. A minimalist of the 19th century. As he writes in his letters, he only keeps what he needs and he's going to show us what his essentials are and how he is packing his fourgon, his coach, which carries his belongings. 
Moscou, 20 septembre 1812. Nous sommes à Moscou, mais nous n'avons plus que des ruines, à l'exception de quelques quartiers échappés aux flammes. Il faut que ces gens-là soient bien barbares pour brûler leur capitale. J'ai pris un parti que tu goûteras. Je n'ai presque plus d'équipage. Je me suis décidé à m'en défaire. Le vice-roi Eugène a pris une partie de mes équipages et de mon argenterie. Je ne garde qu'un fourgon et une caisse d'argenterie. La note a dû être envoyée à Paris. Je pense que le tout se monte à 40 000 francs au moins. Il faudra avoir soin de faire retirer cet argent. Ces fonds me serviront à remplacer ce que j'ai cédé. Il a dû être envoyé un inventaire des objets cédés. Les deux voitures ont été prises pour 10 000 francs chacune. Il faut savoir se passer de ce qui n'est pas nécessaire. Je suis assez mécontent de ma maison. Le pillage démoralise tout. Et moi, je n'aime pas que mes gens s'en mêlent. Si je revois bientôt les bords du Rhin, je te promets mes honnêtes. So what do you have here in your coach? Alors ça, ce sont mes caisses d'argenterie. Là, c'est ma porcelaine de Limoges, avec un motif floral ravissant, très délicat. C'est mon service préféré. Derrière, c'est mes verres en cristal Saint-Louis. Oh, je crois qu'ils ont oublié de me mettre ma caisse de porcelaine de Sèvres. Bon, tant pis, je m'en passerai. Après, derrière, on a quelques caisses de Bordeaux parce que j'aime pas les mauvaises surprises sur la route. Évidemment, mes affaires personnelles, mes pantoufles, mes bonnes de nuit, ma poudre, il y a tout ce qu'il faut. C'est juste le nécessaire en somme. But why do you take your Limoges dinnerware and your silverware when you go on a campaign? It's really hard for us to understand that. Is it really necessary? Mais c'est pas parce qu'on est en campagne qu'on va souper dans des assiettes en carton. On est des militaires certes, mais on n'est pas des sauvages. On est des gens civilisés avec du savoir-vivre. Of course, he can't always have a nice dinner served with his fine, delicate porcelain dishes with the most beautiful and finest table cloth. Coming from the southwest, he sure enjoys his foie gras and his pâté de foie truffé. But some days, there is just no time for any such delights. Because on the battlefield, Monsieur Bessière, he never stops. He can exhaust four horses in a day. So he eats on his horse. And as he is very organized, he always keeps his goûter in his horse pocket. The same he had when he was a child. Because when you fight Prussians or Austrians, you know when it starts, but hard to predict when it ends, so you need to be prepared. So we are going to follow exactly his own recipe. You have of course to imagine he only has this sort of goûter when he is at war, surrounded by his soldiers. He would never have that if he is in Paris. Let's say he has a night plan at the opera house, for example. No, 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 really, it's really at war. You are going to understand. So you take a crust or a slice of grey bread. You rub it with a lot, a lot, a lot of garlic, the most you can. Then you add a bit of walnut oil. And a pinch of salt. you have Monsieur Bessier's goûter. How does it taste like? Not bad, but could be improved, maybe put in the oven. But it's a very decent battlefield goûter, that's for sure. When war is over, Monsieur Bessier is happy to be back home in Paris. You wonder where he lives? Paris Rive Gauche, of course, the left side of the River Seine. It's the elegant, classy, Posh, aristocratic and outrageously expensive part of Paris, according to la Duchesse. In 1801, she says that Paris is very, very expensive. And Rive Gauche, it's where you live when you have made it. So he lives in his hotel, a hotel in French, it's not a place for travelers only, especially in the 19th century, no. It's a two, three story city mansion building, which includes also a court, Room for your carriages, your horses, everything. So Monsieur Bessier, he doesn't share, of course, his hotel with anyone. It's his own place for his wife, his son. 
He's a marshal of the Empire, so of course he's not going to live in an attic. He has the whole building for himself. If you fancy paying him a visit, he is 59 Rue de Lille, right here. Just after the Pont Royal. You see the Pont Royal here? On the other side of La Seine, it's the Tuileries. And his good friend Eugène is also Rue de Lille, a little further. La Duchesse en Andoche, they are Rue de Verneuil, just below. So it's really nice. They are all few minutes away by foot from each other, which is so convenient for parties, dinners, receptions, balls, everything. When he's not working and on the battlefield, he likes his entertainments. Where are you sure to see him in Paris? Well, Rue de Richelieu, at the Opera House, of course. It's La Salle Montancier, and it's the Opera House during the Empire. And it is his favorite place in Paris. In a letter, he compares Paris to Vienna. He had to stay in 1809 in Vienna for a few weeks after being injured after the Wagram battle. His horse was killed just under himself by a cannonball. He was a bit injured, not very seriously, but he had to stay a few weeks in Vienna and he took advantage of this time to visit and explore and to compare Paris and Vienna. Let's see what he says. Vienne, 27 juillet 1809. Voilà deux jours que nous dînons ensemble avec le vice-roi, le prince Eugène et le maréchal du Roc. Aujourd'hui, j'ai eu le plaisir de les avoir chez moi. Cela nous a rappelé à tous trois notre jeune temps. Il y a six ans que nous ne nous étions pas trouvés réunis. Nous avons ensuite été promenés à pied en habit bourgeois et nous sommes convenus que les plaisirs de Vienne ne valaient pas ceux de Paris. Je ne me suis jamais mieux porté, je traîne un peu ma cuisse en marchant et du reste cela va très bien. Je ne m'en sentirai pas du tout, j'espère, dans 15 jours. Mademoiselle Avrion was Joséphine de Beauharnais, head lady's maid. She saw the Bessière couple very often. And what she writes in her memoirs she published is rather interesting. She says that it was such a perfect couple. Adèle was so virtuous, such a perfect behavior, an absolute angel. And the marshal was a very good and very brave man, such a sweet couple. Though it's true that from time to time, Monsieur Bessière, he had an impossibility to resist to what you may call la tentation. And the temptation these days, it's Mademoiselle Virginie. Virginie Le Tellier.
Fiesna, 23 décembre 1806. « Il y a six jours que je ne t'ai écrit, ma chère Adèle. Il doit bien te tarder d'avoir de mes nouvelles. Et moi, je suis bien impatient d'avoir des tiennes. Je te vois t'impatienter, mais ce n'est pas ma faute si je ne t'écris pas. Je suis loin de Varsovie. Ce pays était infesté de parties. Je les ai chassés de partout. C'était le but de ma mission. » Tu apprendras, avec autant de plaisir que j'en ai éprouvé, mes premiers succès dans un grand commandement. J'ai eu une affaire générale de cavalerie contre le seul corps de l'armée prussienne qui reste. Ils ont été battus. Je leur ai pris cinq pièces de canon, deux étendards et beaucoup de prisonniers. Tu sens toute ma joie, surtout si l'empereur est content, comme je l'espère. C'est assez parler de guerre, parlons de nous. Comment te portes-tu Es-tu raisonnable C'est le cas ou jamais, ma chère amie. Tout ceci amènera une paix que rien ne pourra plus rompre. Comment va mon petit Napoléon Fais-lui deux baisers de ma part, et encore deux, je te les rendrai, je te promets. J'envoie aujourd'hui un de mes aides de camp à Varsovie. J'espère qu'il m'apportera plusieurs de tes lettres. À présent, je t'écrirai plus souvent, ça me sera plus facile. Adieu, ma chère Adèle. Tout le monde auprès de moi se porte bien. Sébastien dut t'écrire. Adieu, je t'aime. Et je t'embrasse de tout mon cœur et t'aime bien tendrement. Dorogobudj, 27 août 1812. Nous voilà tout à fait sur la route de Moscou. Je t'écris à 60 lieues de cette capitale. Il est. Dorogobudj, 27 août 1812. <rire>